Uh, I want to read to you today from the book of Joshua. Uh, the book of Joshua has a, a very strange story in it. It's about the s- cities of refuge. Today's subject is about life in the neighborhood, and we're focusing specifically on our city. Uh, we live in cities. God knew that. He created them. He, used, uh, he allows them uh, to be used in very unique ways as we minister to and take care of the needs of people. Uh, they're great ways to connect, to care for, and protect, and to provide organization. And how do we as Christians live lives in our neighborhoods in this city in a very specific way? So I'd like to read to you this passage about cities of refuge, okay? So here it goes, Joshua chapter 20, verses 1, verse 1, beginning there. The Lord said to Joshua, Now tell the Israelites to designate the cities of refuge, as I instructed Moses. Anyone who kills another person accidentally and unintentionally can run to one of these cities. There will be places of refuge from relatives seeking revenge for the person who was killed. Upon reaching one of these cities, the one who caused the death will appear before the elders at the city gate and present his case. They must allow him to enter the city and give him a place to live among them. If the relatives of the victims come to avenge the killing, the leaders must not release the slayer to them, for he killed the other person unintentionally and without previous hostility. But the slayer must stay in that city and be tried by the local assembly, which will render a judgment, and he must continue to live in that city until the death of the high priest who was in office at the time of the accident. After that, he's free to return to his own home in the town from which he fled. The following cities were designated as cities of refuge. Kadesh of Galilee in the hill country of Naphtali, Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim, and Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the hill country of Judah. On the east side of the Jordan River, across from Jericho, the following cities were designated. Bezer in the wilderness, plain of the tribe of Reuben, Ramoth in Gilead in the territory of the tribe of Gad, and Golan in Bashan in the land of the tribe of Manasseh. These cities were set apart for all Israelites as well as the foreigners living among them. Anyone who accidentally killed another person could take refuge in one of these cities. In this way, they could escape being killed in revenge prior to standing trial before the local assembly. What a strange passage. It's kind of an odd one, don't you think? But just imagine this for a moment. There's no prisons in the Israelite nation. There are no judicial systems that sentence people to incarceration. The judicial system in the nation of Israel was restitution. You stole my cow, you have to pay back my cow plus extra. You steal from me and you get caught, you've got to pay me back. That's the way it worked. When you kill someone, your life was demanded of you. It was the way of the system. I mean, it worked quite effectively. There was very little crime. I mean, when you think about it, a death sentence is scary. But now imagine with me for a moment this. You're out with your neighbor. You're chopping wood. You spent the morning together. You probably had a meal together at lunchtime. And you've stacked uh, several cords of wood. And you're getting through to the middle of the day. And you swing the axe and the head of the axe comes off and it strikes your friend and kills him. Can you imagine the panic that you go through at that moment? You think, what do I do? This is before CPR. It's before most first aid opportunities. Many people, most people died. And you run over to your friend and you realize that his body is lifeless. And the tears start to come. And you're like, it was an accident. I didn't mean for it to happen. And so you grab your friend and you you pick him up and throw him over your shoulder and you walk into town and the tears are streaming down your face and every person that you see, you cry out and say, it was an accident. I I didn't mean for it to happen. If I'd only looked ahead of where I was uh, hitting this piece of wood, if I did check the ax head and made sure it was secure, if only, if only, I really screwed up. And you walk up to the house of the family that this man has, wife and children, weeping and wailing, and you lay his body there. And you're like, I'm sorry. I didn't mean for this to happen. And the thing that starts running through your mind as this family begins to weep and to mourn 
is that they have rights to revenge. They're going to come after me because I can't prove anything. I've told them it's an accident, but they don't believe me. And so these ref cities of refuge were set up by God to be a stopgap to keep someone who's accidentally hurt someone from being killed right on the spot. You've got to run to the city. You've got to show up at the gate and plead your case with the elders. The elders of the city will then say, take you aside and set up a court and then figure out whether or not this is truly an accident. And if it was, you have safe harbor here. You cannot be taken from here. We will protect you. We will take care of you and give you a place to live for the rest of your life or until the high priest passes away. And then you're free. Even if the family comes, protection is guaranteed. Cities of refuge were a place where people went when they made a mistake. They struggled. They did something they shouldn't have. And the only recourse they had was to flee to those six cities spread out all over Israel in equal distance so that everyone had a fair chance at a trial. When I read a passage like this in the Old Testament, it's hard to draw a comparison or a, or a line from the Old Testament into the New it's often difficult to make the connection, but I think that this is what's happening. These places were places for people who needed a second chance. They needed a place to go to so that they could start over, that they were doing something by accident. And yes, it had tragic consequences, but it was a safe place, a safe place to go to in a very difficult situation. I think that we as a church function like a city of refuge for people. In our day and age, there is so much hate on people who make big mistakes. I don't know if you have that experience in your own life, or maybe you know somebody who's made the biggest mistake and people just can't get over it. They didn't intend for the harm to happen, or maybe... They just made an error in bad judgment and they don't want it to characterize the rest of their life. We live in a culture that uh, has difficulty getting past mistakes. Ministers, teachers, politicians, we don't want to give them a second chance. And the church, I think, is supposed to be that place where we give people second chances. I think there's a couple of characteristics of what a, a, a city of refuge church might look like. I think that we've got to be focused as a church on today and tomorrow and not on the past. Churches of refuge for people in our community need to be places where they can come and look at the sign on the, on the door as they come in that says, you are welcome here regardless of all of the things that you've done because God loves you just the way you are. And when they walk through this door, we're called to be a place that says, how is it with your soul? Not just, how are you? But how is it with your soul? I think a church of refuge should be a place where mercy triumphs over judgment. That comes from the book of James, by the way. Mercy triumphs over judgment. And what I mean by that is, is that we've got this book, we've got all these rules and regulations in it, and it's our job to make sure that we have it handy so we know what God says. But mercy triumphs over judging people by that book. That when you walk through this door, if you've been in the community and you need a second chance, you want a group of people who say, mercy triumphs here. God does the transforming. We don't do the judging. We want to show love to you the way God shows love to us. I think a church of refuge should be transparent and authentic. We've all got our own warts. We've all got our own failures. And we need to be a place where we don't pick off each other's wounds and scabs. But at least we can show some scars. So we can show how they've been healed. And how God has been at work in our life. And I think a church of refuge should be a place where... We give people the God treatment. How does God treat you is the way that we should treat everyone who walks through this door. And how God's, does God treat us? Well, he sent his son. He loved us that much 
John 3, 16, right? It's that pinnacle verse that describes what God did. But the next verse says, God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but to save it. We're called to treat people the way God treats people. But here's the thing. Church has been a kind of a place for that for the years and the generations. And sometimes what happens is that we get this mixed up idea of what these cities or churches of refuge are supposed to do. They become cloisters. They become country clubs. They become places where we kind of set up walls and say, it's safe in here. God doesn't ask you to, when you become a Christian, to leave your neighborhood or your apartment building and all move in together as a group of people. Why? Why? Because we live in a city. And as people who know the value and benefit of cities of refuge, a place of refuge like the church, we're also called to go into that world because we know this God personally. It's way different than what most of the society thinks, right? They know of God. They, they've heard about him. But we know him personally. It's different. We have this relationship where we, we know what God wants and we want to live our lives by that, but we have this relationship where we talk to him and he talks to us and he shares with us his will and his plan and we, as we walk out of these walls, are called to do the very same thing. Share with people what God has done. But here's the other thing. We bring knowledge about God into our communities. There are so many things at work at our communities, and that's what we're going to do in just a few minutes, is to try and figure out where God is at work. When God gave us this planet, he gave us a living testimony that he is the creator. Psalm 119 says this. I'm going to read it on my phone, but I'll do it faster here. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without sound or word. Their voice is never heard, yet their message has gone throughout the earth and the world, words to all the world. Creation itself speaks of God's presence. That there is a creator, creator because he has created such an incredibly and awesome thing. But beyond that, God is already at work in the world, and it's our job as people who know this place of refuge with God to interpret God's hand at work. When people are good to each other, they're moral and caring and compassionate. When people gather together to take care of the needs of the community, when they share with their lives, they are exhibiting godly characteristics. And it's our job as we walk in and among them through our work and our play and our neighborhoods to point out, oh, there's God at work. Can you see his fingerprints? Can you see the evidence of God doing something in you? And that is a powerful privilege that you and I have to be able to point out in someone else, there's God at work. Really? We get to pray for people. That's the other thing that we get to do. In a world in which has very little relationship with God, they are still very open to praying about God, praying to God. It's an opportunity for us to step into places and spaces with people where they're struggling and say, can I pray for you? Like Heather did. Last Sunday night, I had the opportunity to do that again as we met with some people from the church and just said, hey, can I pray for you? Pray for healing, pray for hope, pray for salvation. We have that opportunity now as we go into our community today. So what I want you to do in the places where you're sitting, and I've asked you to sit around a table, and you should have been able to identify where you live on the map on your table, is I want you to take a few minutes, and I want you to go through the instructions. Uh, Give the instructions to the person who celebrated their birthday the most recently. Okay? So whoever celebrated their birthday the most recently, give them the instructions and just read it through together. And we've got a 15 minutes to carry out this exercise. Go ahead.
So if you're at a table where there's just two of you or three of you, would you pair up with another table that only has just a few as well? So I'm thinking of uh, George and Alan and Peter and Rose. If you would find a table close to you and kind of pair up with them. Yeah. Take your map along. Make sure you have your map. So if you're finished, what we want to do is we want to recreate the city map here on this red piece of uh, whatever it's called. Yeah, mat. Thank you. So uh, if you think that you're on the east side, make sure your map is on the east side. We're going to try to connect them all together. And here's a, a roll of masking tape to put it on the, on the wall. So I'm going to have you uh, turn your attention over here. While they're recreating the map on the wall, I'm going to ask you to kind of bring your attention back up here. One of the things I want you to pay attention to as this map is created, shh, I want you to pay attention to when the map is created is all of the places where God is at work. When you just reflect a minute today before you go, I want you to realize that God is already at work in our community, in our neighborhoods, in our city. It's our job as a church, as a group of people, as an individual to ask the question, God, where are you at work and how can I join you there? Rather than trying to come up with something on our own or maybe even trying to manage something all on our own. Where are you at work and how can I join you there? Isn't that incredible? Look at them all already. Where's Curtis? We need a couple more maps over here. Bring him up there. It's been our hope through this series, and again today I want to bring it to your attention, that maybe God is stirring something in you, something that says, you know what, I would love to be able to help, to commit to, to start, to develop something in my neighborhood or in my city, or join God at work somewhere already in my community. And if you want to do that, we would love for you to try and get together with people, maybe even at your uh, table today. You've had some kindred spirits about a few things and say, you know what? We could do that together. We could help that place or that group of people together and begin to think about how God might use you in that way. We as a church want to support you in doing that the best way we can. We'll try and resource, uh, coach, mentor, uh, provide any structure we need in order to make that work. But come talk to us. Uh, Great ideas come from, uh, yeah, from you. Uh, I'm not the great idea maker. <laughs> God is going to do something in you already.